Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to Joshua chapter 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Joshua chapter 1. I do have the mic on, don't I, brother? Huh? My ears feel like they're, I feel like I'm going up in a balloon or something. <coughs> I think Jim, Tim did that to me while ago was up here singing. <laughs> you, blew my, you blew the sound in my ears, Tim. Amen. Things that cause Christians to burn out. You know, there's a such thing. I've, I've, hey, as a pastor, I've seen it. I've seen it. One thing I try to do is when I pastor a church or a flock of people, especially when I have a Christian school and a lot of uh, different activities in the church and people are involved, you'd be amazed at how involved people can get sometimes. So involved. <coughs> they can get so involved that Sooner or later, they'll burn slap out if they're not careful. And a wise pastor will watch that. But most preachers find someone like that in their church, they'll, they'll work them until they drop, you know, and that's not good. You, you got you got to pay attention. To, you got to know your people, and you got to watch them. And uh, if, 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 if things are getting too rough, you got to walk up and say, hey, time for you to take a break. It's time for you to spend a little maybe a week or two at home with a family. <laughs> I've, I've had some workers with me that I believe they'd live at the church if they had a bed down there or something. I'm telling you, they, they just loved doing things, working around the church, doing things. I believe there's people, there's people who really get that addicted to it. I, I've seen it happen. And you have to watch it because it, <clears throat> what happens when they leave a situation like that and go somewhere else, they determine in their heart, I'm just not going to get involved. Uh, I wasted my whole time over there, <laughs> and I'm not going to do it here. And and I'm afraid there's a lot of people on this base out here that come from some good churches back in the States. I really believe that in my heart and soul. They're out there, and they are bound to turn with this. It's not going to get themselves involved. Uh, they had enough of it where they was at. Well, we don't need that to happen. Amen? Things that cause Christians to burn out. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. Joshua, uh, God, here in this script, God command. Listen, this is a command <clears throat> from God. He said, be strong and of good courage. That's a command of God. Do you know that? Be strong and of good courage. This is not a suggestion. Do you know that as a Christian, God commands you and God commands me to be strong in our faith and walk with him? We have no right to burn out or give up or quit. We don't. We don't have a right to do that. Uh, we have no scripture at all in this Bible to, to, to back up an annual nervous breakdown. <laughs> so some people get. And they do get them. I've seen it happen. <clears throat> Many of God's children are in the light or, or the sight of victory in their Christian life. Someone said one time, <clears throat> victory was just around the corner, but they didn't make the turn. They quit just short of victory. Most people do quit just short of victory. And it's really discouraging and depressing to a pastor to see that, especially when you got so many people got so much potential in their lives. We all, everybody in this room, got potential that God used for his glory and his honor. And I know that, and I try my best to cultivate that the best way I can try to help you see that so your life will be one you'll look back on one day and rejoice in the Lord that you did uh, stay the stuff. Amen? You didn't just talk the talk, you walked the walk. And that's so important. And uh, many of God's children, are, they, they quit. They throw in the towel. And become, they become one more unnecessary casualty uh, in the cause of Christ. Why do people do that, Brother Ron? Why do people quit? Why do people just quit on God? Uh, I'll give you some reasons tonight. There may be others, but these are some good ones right here. The first one I give you is the identity crisis. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Amen? Remember that's what the Scripture said? We are a new creature in Christ. Since he saved us, we're not what we used to be. May not be what we ought to be, but thank God we're not what we used to be. And I'm so glad 
I can testify to that tonight. Failure to recognize that since you got saved, you'll become a new creature in Christ. That's, <clears throat> that's sad for some people. Uh, you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You are now a child of, of God. First John, uh, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave power uh, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. In other words, beloved, we have all the resources of God that are needed to be victorious in life. We do. We do. The number one reason why so many burn out and quit is that they forget who they are. They forget who they are. That's right. 2 Peter 1.9. I have a message on this scripture here, by the way. It's called the precious blood of the Lord. But 1 Peter 1 9 says, But he that lacketh these things uh, is blind, cannot see afar off, hath forgotten, he, have, he, have, he was purged from his old sins. Now, that word purged from his old sins, that means he was saved. That means he was under the blood. So that he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And look here, hath forgotten hath forgotten. Man, you say, Brother Ronnie, is it possible for some Christians to get that far away from God that they really forget they've even been saved? Yeah, yeah. That's why a lot of them go to some other place and attempt to get saved again. <laughs> Got news for you, God only saved you one time. That just compounds the problem. You hear me? That just compounds the problem. I've, I've had several people tell me lately, well, I just got saved twice just to make sure I was saved. Brother, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to take the chance in going to heaven with that type of a testimony. I want to know for sure that I know that I know I've been born again. You hear me? You don't just get up and say, "Well, Lord, save me." Uh four or five different times hoping that one of them took. No, you can know that you're saved. You can know it. You don't have to hope so, maybe so. Now, I come out of Pentecostal church where, man, if you made a mistake, that was it. You lost on your way to hell, and you get saved all over again. <laughs> That's not in this Bible. I'll challenge anybody to come up here and show me in this book where that is possible. It's impossible. That's the power of the blood of the Lamb of God. Once you're saved, you are saved, whether you like it or not. You're saved. I'm glad to know it. You hear me? I belong to him. I've had lots of people come to me. Yeah, but you can. I said, what do you mean you can? God says, no man. Listen to this. No man. I'm a man. Am I not a man? No man shall pluck you out of my Father's hand. Once you're in the Father's hand, no man. That goes for Ron Parrott. I can't even do it myself. You hear me? Well, Brother Perry, if I believe that, I just go out here and live wild and reckless like I want to and do everything I want to. That's not what, hey, no, sir. That's not a, salvation is a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's not joining a, a, a club or something like some people think it is. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You're saved. Scripture, 2 Peter right here, he buries this out. They got so far away from God that they forgot they had been purged a, pur a purge for their sin. They forgot. So that's the problem with a lot of people today. They forget who they are. And you're saved. You're saved. And you will meet the Lord. Hey, and there will, there will be rewards in heaven, and there will be loss of rewards in heaven. The Bible clearly teaches that. Amen? And I want the rewards, amen? <laughs> oh, we have all the resources. Then the lack of commitment. That's another thing. 
Commitment's a very important word. It's like when you get married, you're committed one to another. But we want to treat our marriage like some people treat salvation. They just quit any time they want. <laughs> well, you can't. You can't. But it's not right. Even Israel themselves accused God of divorcing them. You know what God said to Israel? Show me. God told them, show me the writing of divorce. <laughs> there never was one. There never was one. Hey, don't get me wrong. I'm not against divorced people. I'm against divorcing. My wife and I both came up in broken homes. We know what it's all about. Know a lot of other people. And it happens whether you like it or not. It happens. It's a reality. But just because you go through one, don't make you a second rate Christian by any means whatsoever. You can still go and serve God and live for Him in spite of it. That's what I try to tell people. But uh, commitment. First Thessalonians 5 20 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Commitment is an almost forgotten word in the Christian vocabulary. If Barbara and I weren't committed, we would not be here today. We would have quit a long time ago. When you're not committed, yeah, you can quit anywhere you want to along the way. If you're not committed, if you never made a commitment to the Lord, you can quit anywhere along the way. I hate to see that. I love to see committed people. And I know the, the blessings of being committed. And I do get weary sometimes. I get tired sometimes. I get, I get frustrated sometimes. I get to the point, I, get, I let the, the flesh take over sometimes. I get very irate, even with myself, and convince myself, it's over. You might as well quit and go home. But if you committed to the Lord, just like Jeremiah, he'll light a fire in you, and he'll, he'll let that explosion take place inside you, and he'll light you up. Amen? God keeps me going. That's, what Paul, that's why Paul said, I know whom I have believed and persuaded he's able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. That's talking about your soul too, brother. Paul had committed his soul to Jesus Christ, and God's going to keep it to the day, to that day. And that day is just down the road. And Paul's day did come. Amen. All right. So, yet Paul says here, sanctify you holy. Your whole spirit, your body, and, and your soul and body blameless. Today we have soul salvation with daily sinful living. And as a Christian, we are to be different because of who we represent. Everything we do, everywhere we go, People ought to think better of God because of our commitment to him. It ought to affect them in that manner. Then, it, then there's unconfessed sin. Of course, that's, there's a lot of people that want to run around. They, they're, they're, they're messing in sin, but they don't want to call it sin. They say, it's just one of those things. You know, it's just one of those things. It's one of those things that God calls sins, beloved. That's what it is. And that's what it is. It's unconfessed. Amen? What does it say in the book of Psalms? If I regard, regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. Yeah. God hears my prayers. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I remember a preacher, Moultrie, Georgia. Hmm. <laughs> Him and his song leader ran off together. And uh, he claimed he had a case of amnesia. So, I swear to God. And we was in her, her aunt owned a women's dress shop. And we was in there, and that lady walked in. And you got to know her aunt, Reba. Anybody else seen the movie Annie Main? I mean, uh, she... Her Aunt Reba was just a very outspoken woman. Hey! Hey, Mary, I hear you the preacher ran off together. I ran in front of everybody in the whole store. <laughs> oh, Reba, we, 
We just made for each other. We had prayer every night before we went to bed. Yeah. And, and, and Reba just, what? You what? Yeah, we just had prayer every night. And in fact, he's just using you, Reba. Said, no, he's not, honey. Watch this. She picked up the phone, called him, and said, you want to meet me? And she took off. They went again. You, you know what the uh, end results of that was? That preacher was coming down the road a few days later, had a wreck, burned to death in his car. Burned to death in his car. God didn't hear his prayer, but God knew what he was doing. Knew what he was doing. The guy was a reproach and a disgrace to the ministry and to the gospel. I hate to say it, there's a lot of those rascals out there today. The world's full of them. You hear me? He wasn't committed. He, wouldn't, he was committed, all right, but not to God. He had sin in his life that he would just call him one of those things, and God understands. He promised that, well, God put her in my life. I've had them say that. I've had, I've, had, I've had guys walk in my office and tell me their marriage is over and God had put another woman in their life. And I've told them right to their face, I said, not the God that I know, son. Now, the God of this world probably has, but God of heaven sure hadn't put nothing like that in your life. You're accusing him of something horrible. You better be careful of that. That's what I tell them. We had a guy, we had a, Bob, remember that? We had a guy came to church, brought his, he had one of them high school kids hanging on his arm, sat in front of the church. It was testimony time. He got up and said, I want to give a testimony. And I said, oh, God, where are we going with this? Because everybody in the church knew that wasn't his wife on his shoulder. He said, I just want to thank God for her. God put her in my life. I walked up there and said, sir, you're a blatant liar. And honey, this guy has a wife and four kids in the States. I want you to know that. God didn't put you two together. But I guarantee you Satan did. You know, that guy had to, he had to, the brass to sit there through the whole service while I preached and everything. <laughs> Unconfessed sin. Was he saved? I'm not judging their soul. I tell you, God was nowhere near that. You and I both know that. God was no, the God of this Bible was nowhere near that stuff. Unconfessed sin. <laughs> oh, God did not make your shoulders or mine either one big enough to carry our sin. He never did. That's why he died on the cross. He judged it there. He took it all on him. He bore the burden on the cross of Calvary. Amen? And, you know, sin a lot of times starts out just a little sin. Oh, it's just one of them little sins. <laughs> it's not much to it, you know. <laughs> but <clears throat> if you don't confess it and get right with the Lord, it will eventually kill or destroy you like that preacher killed him. And, and I can tell you stories about that, too. And, whew, we won't go there, but I'm telling you, I know a lot of people that went home early. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. And that's the truth. Be in another one I like to be sure your sin will find you out. Oh, it may not find you out the day after you do it. It might show up 10, 15 years down the road. Look at these politicians that runs for office. Good Lord, the skeletons they dig out of a closet. Isn't that something? Yeah, people vote them in. They'll vote that slime in. That slime, vermin, is what it is. I can't have respect for that. Well, anyhow, we must deal with every sin as soon as we discover it. And, and, and you know, when we discover it, I'd like to say something about that. You're saved. 
Who is it that's in you? Who indwells you? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> do you think you're going to do or get involved in your sin without knowing it? Of course not. Not a one in this room. Why? That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to convict and convince of sin. That's his work in our heart and life. And, and, and buddy, I can say something, do something, look the wrong way, think something, and boy, the Holy Spirit is right there to, to uh, remind me of what I am and what I'm doing. Yes, sir. I got a feeling he works that way with you too. Well, that's you, Brother Parrish, not me. Oh, no, no, that's how God works with all of his people, all of his children. That is the work of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you, to convict you, to condense you. And he does. You wouldn't be saved today if it weren't for that. You know that? That's right. Then the fourth thing is detachment. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. You remember when you first got saved, you had a sweet fellowship with the Lord. You just had to tell everybody. You couldn't keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I thought, happened to me. Called my mama and all that. <laughs> mama got saved. Well, she said, whatever that is, I'm happy for you. You sound real happy. <laughs> I was, brother. I was happy. God saved me. Oh, I felt so good. I was happy. But somewhere along the way, you begin to overlook that fellowship that kept you so close to the Lord. And, uh, but somewhere along the way, you begin to look in other directions and things, forget all about it. In other words, you got detached. Something detached you, took you away from that fellowship. I've known people. Come to me and I pray, oh, preacher, I got to have a job. Pray for me, I get a job. And they get a job and think they don't show up in church for two or three weeks and you get in touch with them. Brother, we've been missing you in church. What's going on? Well, my job won't let me come on Wednesday and Sundays anymore. It's not a job, that's a detachment. That's a detachment. The fellas, I ain't, hey, I'm not. Riding on these, you, you military fellows that got duty, get, have TDY and have responsibilities, carry you late in the middle of the night or two or three days. I understand all that. I was part of that myself. But when you can be and when you should be at church, you ought to be. Because if you allow yourself to get detached by anything, and be careful what you blame on the Lord too, by the way. A job's a good thing. A person needs a job. They need a job to work need a job to support their family and stuff. I understand that. Give security and confidence. I understand that. But when that job uh, takes the place of God in your life, that's your God. It's not your job. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just being frank with you and being honest with you. You can't let things like that detach you. I'm telling you. I remember when I worked at Ford Motor Company, man, my marriage was falling apart and everything. I was making the best money I've ever made in my life. I was a finished spray painter. Well, I walked in one night. I'd been in, the, I'd been in the hospital, got out of the hospital celebrating, got in a bad car wreck, got put back in the hospital. <laughs> and so I was out of work for about 40-something days. And I went back in and reported to the, uh, the uh, big boss man there. And boy, he was in there cussing people out left and right. It come my turn. I got in there, and I, I got to thinking to myself, I said, my wife, my family, my home means more to me than this job. Because that job was keeping me away from my family like I should be. I said, hey, before you open your mouth to me, sir, I want to tell you something about this job. <laughs> I said, you can have it. What? I said, you can have it. I'm going home. You can't do that. I said, watch me. I walked in here. I'm going to walk out. I went home. Got me a job where I could be home with my family. Didn't make the money I made it forward, plant. But I made enough to take care of me and my family. Money ain't everything. You hear me? Family's everything. 
Can't let things detach you from God. Amen? You're either going forward or you're going backward with the Lord. Then loneliness, that's another thing that uh, helps people to fall. They get very lonely. Uh, a man that has friends must show himself friendly, the Scripture says. That's right. You can be very lonely even in a crowd. You know that? You can be in a huge crowd of people and be as lonely as you can be. I know. I've felt that myself before. I know what it's like. Amen? You should never say people aren't friendly to me. What you're saying is I'm not friendly to people. That's about the truth of it. And when you reach out to people, <laughs> people will reach out to you. Then, number six, bitterness. We talked about that already. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Beloved, if you're really serving the Lord, somewhere down, down the line, people are going to disappoint you. It's coming. You can count on it. But, but, but I'm telling you, they will mistreat you. They'll disappoint you. But that doesn't give you a right to burn out or have a nervous breakdown. Me either. You see? A quit. You just don't know how hurt I got. Okay. Malice and jealousy are cancers that will kill you. We need to stop blaming you know, not, remember I said, you don't blame someone else for your, for, for, for your bitterness. Success, listen to me, joy and happiness, these things are personal choices. Personal choices. You either choose to be angry and bitter, or you can choose to be nice and tender and kind. It's your choice. Sure, people are going to say hurtful things. <laughs> hey, it, it, hey, it never changes. Maybe the face changes or the voice changes or the gender changes, but you're going to always run into those who are going to mistreat you and, and, and disappoint you. That don't give us a reason just to quit. I've seen so many people walk out of church because they're mad at somebody in the church. Usually it's a preacher. Don't even know what I've done wrong half the time. <laughs> so remember, it's a choice. You have to make it yourself. No one make it for you. Then lastly, no vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no vision, the people perish. There was a time in your first love when you had a vision of accomplishing great things for the Lord. I think we all do. Amen? We get in love with the things of God, His Word, His church, His people. We have a wonderful time, a good relationship. Boy, every intention is to get involved as we can get. You know, maybe you want to be a Sunday school teacher. Uh, maybe you want to be a soul winner. Maybe you want to do some uh, preaching or teaching or tithing or singing in the choir or singing specials. And on and on we could go, you know, working in Pat's Pee Wee and all that stuff. You had a vision of helping build a great work for the Lord. And by the way, that's, what, that's exactly what God's called us all to do, to build a great work for Him, to build a great work. Don't go looking for one. Get involved in building one. Lord, we sure need them. Amen? This has been a great work here for many years, and, boy, the workstation's here. We just need to get involved in it. Amen? I know Jimmy every Sunday gets up here and makes a plea for people to sing in the choir, you know, and there's some good voices out there. And, and uh, they could be using that gift and talent for the Lord. Folks, you be, you're in a church where, you, you're in a church, <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's not one of them big churches like you come from the state, but you're in a place where, man, you got a talent. Preacher's probably just more than glad he, <laughs> for you to use it. Amen. The more you use it, the less he has to do. <laughs> That's the way I feel about it. I always believe in getting people involved. I think it's important. Because the more involved you are in the things of God, 
That's why I'm here today. I got so involved in my church after I got saved and knew what it meant to be born again and everything. I got so involved in my church, brother, I just, I just kept wanting to do more and more and more and more and more. And my pastor finally just took me and brought me up to Tennessee Temple. I believe he did that just to get rid of me, get me out of his hair. I was driving him crazy. And we got up to Tennessee Temple. I said, whew, well, this is, Barbara, this is where we belong. I believe my pastor said, amen. <laughs> Oh, my son. And when I got there, I got involved in the bus ministry. I was working for the school. I got to do street preaching. I got involved in the chapel. It was so bad. <laughs> the students came by my house one night. I said, Brother Parrott, he was a bill. Brother Parrott, why did, why did God send you up here? Well, he sent me up here to get prepared for the mission field. Yeah. Yeah, you're involved in street meetings, and you're involved in the chapel upon the hill, you're involved in the bus ministry, you're involved in this and that. He said, when you got time to go to school? <laughs> had, uh, of course, I learned a lesson from that. Yes, God sent me there to do that, so I had to buckle down and give up a few things. And when I did, some of my buddies prayed I'd get saved. <laughs> crowd, spiritual people. You had a vision to help you build a great work. Amen? Somewhere along the way, you lost that vision. And friend, that's sad. So in closing, when you do that, you're ready to quit. But I say don't quit. Get your eyes fixed on God and determine that you're going to go on because he commands you to be strong and of good courage. Then Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 67, 68, he said unto the twelve, will you also go away? Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, <laughs> to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life, of eternal life. And folks, that's what we ought to focus on, him. Focus on the Lord. I try to stay focused on my Lord. And wherever he wants me to go, whatever he wants me to do, I try to be prepared and ready to go in a moment's notice. Amen. I get up in the morning dressed and go somewhere. My wife's different. You want her to go with you, you got to wait three or four hours. So if I want to go to get up in the morning all excited and want to go to Cracker Barrel or IHOP, I have to wake her up by four. So she'd be ready by eight. But anyhow, I'm just telling you, folks, stay focused on the Lord. That's the truth and you know it. I wouldn't lie in this pulpit. That's the gospel. Things that keep cause people to, to quit. And I think you heard some good reasons why people do, and I hope none of them is yours. <laughs> Amen? If it is, then, hey, let this be a warning and hey, cut you off at the pass, man, and make you go the right direction. Amen? And live for him. You'd be glad you did. You'd be glad you did. I've lived long enough and preached long enough to serve the Lord long enough to tell you Brother, there ain't nothing better than this. Not for me. Ain't nothing better than this for me. I'm telling you that right now. And it's like I said, the days are going to come, and Miss Paris not going to be able to get on no plane and go anywhere. And all we're going to have to do is sit on our back porch. Amen, baby? Watch the squirrels eat up our peacocks. That's all. Bite us over them things. Seven, eight pecan trees, and I can't pick up a one out of the yard. Not a one. But we just talk about the things of the Lord and the wonderful memories God gave us. It's a blessing. Amen.